Yesterday we had the uh, garage sale for the youth here at the church and it uh, always amazes me uh, how that all comes together. All, a lot of people, all of you and a lot of people bring stuff and they donate that and you bring in boxes and you set out all this stuff and collectively you look at it and said, this is a bunch of stuff. <laughs> what are we going to do? And we had people price it, and, uh, you know, most items were priced, you know, anywhere from a quarter to three bucks or four bucks. There were a few items that went for a little more than that. Um, but at the end of the day, all of that little bit that comes together and all those quarters and dollars, I think the kids raised a little over $2,000. And uh, so that's neat. And then there was a gift on top of that of an individual, so the total was around $3,000 that was taken in, and, and this gift was from someone that's not even part of the church here, someone in the community that appreciates what's going on. And So the only reason I share that, uh, other than say thank you for bringing this stuff, is to, it's a wonderful illustration of what God does when his body comes together. And we all put in a little bit. And uh, God takes that, and it's like multiplying two fish and five loaves of bread. He does amazing things with that. So um, thank you for your faithfulness, but uh, thank God for his faithfulness uh, of how he takes what we have and does amazing things. Let's think of that as we gather this offering today, today so, so that he can do still amazing things as we go forward. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the amazing blessing that you show us. Every time, Lord, we step out in faith and put our trust in you, you uh, exceed what uh, we can imagine. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we just pray that you'll take these gifts this morning and offering. May they be a blessing to you and your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As they take up the offering, I'm just going to take a few moments to share with you a little bit more about Patty, uh, so there's a little more explanation there of what's going on, so you can uh, encourage them and pray for them. Um, she had the, it's a carcinoid tumor removed from the upper lobe of her right lung, and everything went great in surgery. Uh, no surprises, no, nothing unexpected, and everything uh, went well. Uh, she's not going to have to face any um, treatments, uh, radiation or chemotherapy or anything like that. So everything went as well as uh, they hoped that it would in the surgery. So she's up at the Moffitt Cancer Center in uh, Tampa. And not sure when she'll go home, tomorrow or Tuesday. I really don't know. They don't know yet. But uh, that's kind of the status of uh, what she's... Uh, going through and uh, we thank God and we praise him <clears throat> for the answered prayers for her surgery but there'll be um, a recovery as she comes home and uh, if you want to just give them a word of encouragement or a card or something probably the best thing to do is to send it to their home address right now because we're not sure when they'll be uh, leaving Tampa and it may be you know in a couple days and It'd probably just be best to send something to their home and do that if you want to do that. So uh, that's uh, kind of an update on that, and uh, thank you for your, your support for that. Last week, I started a new series called Take God at His Word, and I forgot my book down here. We uh, made available, uh, had about 100 of these books out on the table, and they're all taken which is great. We've ordered more. I was hoping to get them here by today, but they did not come in. So next week, uh, Justin will be sharing in the message. It's going to be a youth Sunday. It's going to be a great Sunday. Hopefully the books will be out there. If you took one, please don't take another because the people in the 11 o'clock service didn't get any of them, all right? <laughs> you, and that's great. You guys are so good in taking this, uh, and that, that's a good thing, and I hope that you're taking time to read it and look through it. This week, uh, what I'm going to share this morning, you'll find a lot of it in chapters 2 and 3, but there again, I'm not just regurgitating this to you. I'm sharing with you uh, my personal understanding of God's Word and this whole theme, but, but I love the, uh, the title, Take God at His Word. And that's what I want to 
talk about today. See, there's this beginning point for everything. And when it comes to this whole thing of giving and sharing and generosity in the church, a foundational thing that we all have to understand is this, that God has given us gifts and responsibilities. If you read the creation account, it's an amazing story how God created the heavens and the earth and all the things in it and all the creatures of the sea and all the plants and all the everything there. And then at the end of that, he created you and I. He created mankind and breathed into them the breath of life. And God has given us, literally, He has given us life. He has given us His breath. It says that we are created in His image. And that's an amazing thing. He has also given us His creation. And at the end of chapter 1, He says, uh, after He's created mankind, He says, now, I'm giving you this creation to, and the word is used differently. Some say to have dominion over, some say to do. It basically means to take care of what He's blessed us with. And we have that responsibility. You may have heard of the word stewardship, in that God has asked us to be stewards. To be a steward is to care for something, all right? Now, maybe you've been in this situation. You have a neighbor leaving town, and they ask you to come over and feed their dog, water their plants, you know, things like that. What they are doing, they're asking you to be a steward, of those things to be a caretaker to watch over those things and my guess is if you've ever been in the situation where that plant has died while they're gone um, you feel really bad our neighbor Lori had the unfortunate our dog died while we were gone and uh, we were down visiting Harry uh, uh, le uh, le up visiting Harry and Chris Lefferts and she called and, yeah that's probably the worst thing that could happen uh, <laughs> to have the dog die that you're taking care of. But uh, it was sick anyway, so it wasn't her. <laughs> it wasn't her fault, all right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I left her with a sick dog. So anyway. <laughs> the point of that is when we're stewards, we're good stewards, and, and it feels good when things work out. But if we... Um, you know, something goes wrong during that, you know, we feel, feel terrible. Well, God has called us to be stewards of our lives that He's blessed us with, the time that He's given us here on this earth, the, the, the things that we enjoy, the very environment. I've, I've become a lot more aware of the environment and those things uh, since I've lived in Florida. Living in the Midwest, you know, you were surrounded by corn and soybeans. That's all you ever saw. And... Uh, but here you got the water, and you know, and you can be out in the water, you can see any more, you know, it just irks me if I see a plastic bag floating in the gulf, or a, a can floating by, or you, you're on the beach, and it's like, come on people, uh, you can do better than that. So God has given us gifts and responsibilities, but along with that, is the whole thing of our material blessings, and our, our material things. He has also asked us to be stewards of that. To be, to take care of that which he has blessed us with. And to use that for him. So today I just kind of want to share, maybe just more from my heart than, than anything. Um, where I think the Bible is. When it comes to this whole thing of giving. Because some people get really uptight about this. And that oh great, the preacher's preaching about money again. Or you know, all they want's this, all they want's that. Just let me say up front, that's, that's not the case. Alright? Um, where I'm at is this. You know, God has blessed uh, our lives personally. Uh, beyond ways that, that I would have never imagined. And he's blessed the church and others. And I just want to let you in on how that happens. It's, it's because of God and who He is. So, I want us to start off with this and realize that God has given us some amazing promises in His Word. God has promised forgiveness of sin. We all like that promise, don't we? Because, let's be honest, we'd all be in a mess without it, all right? 
1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our, our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's a wonderful promise. And we take God at His word on that. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I, I want to take God at His word on that because that is so important in my life and so important in your life. And without it, we would be lost. God has also promised to help us at hard times of our lives. There are many verses I could have shared with this, but I particularly like Matthew 11, verse 28. It says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know, we've all been there in our lives, where we've been weary and burdened. And Jesus is saying that at the end of a day where he's been teaching, and he stops, I, I picture as he stops, and he looks back out over the crowds, and he looks at, back over the valley, and he sees the throngs of people that have been following him, seeking something in their life, seeking help, seeking because of the burdens they were carrying. And he stops and he looks at him and says, All right, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I take God at his word on that. Because it's a wonderful promise that he gives. And it's something that we all need in our lives. God has promised us salvation. We've got to take His word on that. We can't do it ourselves, can we? You could help 3,000 little old ladies across the street a week. And that's probably possible here in Benita, all right? And that's terrible. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm there, all right? I have a birthday this month, so uh, not getting any younger myself, but... Uh, it's not something we can earn. It's something that, that, that only... Listen, John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him shall what? Shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I take God at his word on that. Because we've seen what he's done. And how he's fulfilled that verse. And how he fulfills it each and every day. So, I want to encourage you not to be afraid to take God at his word in other areas of our lives. When it comes especially to this thing of giving. Listen to these verses. These are God's word also. Wonderful promises. Proverbs 3, Old Testament, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. It's an agricultural society, most of the Old Testament, and, and most of these illustrations that, that God gives when it comes to this sharing of what we have are agricultural. And he says, your barns will be filled. And some of you are farmers, or you're from the, the Midwest, you understand that. In fact, in Illinois, and I haven't heard what the crop was this year, but when we were up there, if they had a bumper crop of corn, the, all the silos and all the grain bins that they have all over Illinois would not be big enough to hold those. So they started making these great, big, huge concrete um, circles and they would dump the grain on that and cover them with... Uh, it was basically they're making a mountain of corn and they'd cover it with a tarp to uh, store the surplus of grain. And that's kind of the image of, of, of this verse. Um, Honor God, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing. Your vats will brim over. And uh, that's a promise of God. And it's something that we can take as his word. Take him at his word. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap in sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Not reluctantly. Or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, 
having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And I like that, that last phrase, you will abound in every good work, because it's not just about finances there. It's about who we are as people and how when he takes care of our needs, it, to be honest with you, it frees us up to be more of who God wants us to be. And he uses that word all there three times. Uh, all, all things, all times, all that you need. And uh, I, I want to take God at his word when it comes to that. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Probably one of the greatest sections of teaching in Scripture. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, three chapters, is the longest narrative of, of teaching we have in the New Testament of Jesus as far as him at one time sharing all this teaching. And he says in there in chapter 6, almost directly in the middle of this uh, Sermon on the Mount, he says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, about what you will eat or about, what you, about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much, are you not more valuable than they are? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And I, I just love that illustration. Look at the birds of the field. And then he, prior to this, uh, look at the flowers of the field and the birds of the air. Two very simple things that Anybody in any culture, this is a timeless illustration. We can relate to that. And he says, you know what? You're a lot more important than those birds or those flowers that die and wither and are thrown into the fire for then they would have been used for fuel. And he said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you because you are my creation. And I love you, and you can take me at my word on this. And then a passage in Malachi that you've heard a lot of times quoted. Malachi 3, 10 through 12. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Now that passage you've heard a lot. Maybe you've never heard anybody actually teach about that passage and things. I just want to share with you what I consider some, some teaching points. I'm behind on my slides here. I want to just share with you some teaching points that I think it's, it's good, and hopefully this will help us understand this. First, the motivation has to be right. If you go back and read Malachi, it's the last book in the Old Testament, okay? And it's near the end of the development of the Jewish religious system because what you have there's 400 years between Malachi being written and Matthew being written there's 400 year span in that what is called the intertestamental period in the New Testament all of a sudden we find there's Pharisees and Sadducees and the Sanhedrin and all these structures of the Jewish religious organization you don't see any of that in the Old Testament because it develops in that intertestamental period. But at the end of the Malachi, what had happened, some of those religious groups had kind of started to organize themselves. Mainly the priest. And it was kind of the priest kind of led into the development of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the context of Malachi was this. The priest, they'd been around for a long time. The whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament had been getting around for a long time where if you committed a certain sin, you were to go and offer a sacrifice at, to the altar. And their Old Testament specified what type of offerings for what type of sin. Well, what had happened by the time Malachi come around, basically become corrupted, and the religious leaders, 
they were said, yeah, we know you have to give sacrifices to God. But they had altered the mindset from being a time of worship and repentance and asking God's presence in their life to a mere obligation. They, oh yeah, I know we're supposed to do this. Yeah, we're supposed to sacrifice the lamb. Well, go out and find the scrawniest lamb you can find and bring it in and we'll do this thing. And that was kind of the attitude that had developed. And, and, and God, through the prophet Malachi, says to these religious leaders, Come on, guys, get your act together. You, you're, you've done that, you're approaching it. It's n nothing to do about obligation. It's nothing to do about just doing it because you, you feel you have to. The whole point of it was to go to God and say, God, I love you, I need you, please forgive me. And that was the whole concept behind the offering. So that's why God says, verse 9, it, it, it says, God says to him, says, you're robbing me. And they say, well, how are we robbing you? And that's what the context of verse 10 is. It says, you're robbing me by not bringing the tithes and the offerings. So the motivation when we give, the motivation has to be right. If, if, if you're just doing it out of sense of obligation to get God off your back, you might as well not do it. Because it, it's about the heart. It's about the heart. When he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. What in the world is that? That's not really a word we use today. It's a word that was pretty common in the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, Jesus uses it. And in the, that culture, a tithe was 10%. If um, they had 10 lambs born that year, then they were to give one of those lambs as an offering to God. And grain, same thing. And it's something that began way back in the book of Genesis, where Abraham brought a tithe to Melchizedek, a king, and said, here is my, my tithe. And that principle of giving throughout the Old Testament carries over into the New Testament. So I, I've had some people ask, well, what am I supposed to give? And I said, well, first off, it's, it's about your heart. And that verse I, I read just a little while ago says, each man must determine in his heart what he is to give. Well, the, the biblical example that's given is, is bringing a tithe or 10% or of that as an offering to God. And that was the Old Testament principle. comes in this verse, but it's also used in other verses. Jesus affirms that in the, Old, in the New Testament. And then there's a phrase in there that's really interesting. It says, God says, test me in this. This is the only time in Scripture... You will find God saying, go ahead, make my day, you know. <laughs> and it's interesting that he uses that phrase, test me in this. And I don't think it's like a, you know, double dog dare or anything like that, as we might use that. And what God is saying is, that, trust me, I'm, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you in this. And, it, and um, I, I know in, in my life, it was something that, I had to grow into in my life. I uh, came from a family where giving was not part of, of uh, the equation usually. And uh, when Judy and I got married, we were making a whole lot of money. I remember the first year I did the taxes, my taxes on my own. It was like 20% of my income had to go to taxes because I did it wrong. It just kind of like devastated me, you know. And... Uh, so it was a learning process for us. And, uh, but we said, we want to do this. And, and God was faithful. And that's my story. There are a lot of stories out here where people would say the same thing. And um, it, it's just been a blessing to take God at his word in this area. And then he says, there's going to be overflowing blessings says, I will pour out so much blessing that you will have not enough room for it. And then he gives an agricultural illustration of that. There again, that society they lived in. He said, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines from your fields will not cast their fruits. And it'd be easiest for us to say, well, 
I don't have any crops and I have, uh, I don't even have any fruit trees anymore. I got rid of them all, you know. Well, that's God's way of saying, I'm going to take care of what you have. If pests would devour their crops, you heard of the ten plagues, and one of those plagues was the locusts that came in and ate everything. That happens, you're, you're, you're out of business. My one uh, experiment on uh, having a garden down here, uh, first year or so, I said, I'm going to plant some zucchinis. And... Uh, Made this little plot out in the backyard and planted them and, and they grew, they, they came up and they grew and finally they got big enough and they had these, you know, blooms on them. And one morning I went out and they're gone. <laughs> Something had come along and had eaten those plants down to the nubs in the ground. I couldn't believe it, you know. That's what it means when it says, pests will not devour your crops, all right? I was not a good <laughs> illustration of that because maybe I, you know, I don't know what I'd done wrong. But uh, anyway, but that's, that's how God just illustrates to that culture in that day. He says, this is the way it's going to be. And today, we can translate that to uh, whatever works in our lives. You know, you may have, you know, uh, stuff that never wears out. You may... Uh, Find a, a bargain at a garage sale that is something that you've needed that's in better shape than what you could have went out to buy. There, there's all kinds of ways I think God blesses us and takes care of us. Uh, and sometimes we just don't open our eyes to it. Uh, sometimes I think we live too much by coincidence or what we interpret as coincidence and fail to see that, you know, that was God's blessing in my life in that way and this day. And uh, so... God there in Malachi gives us some wonderful, wonderful concepts when it comes to this whole thing of giving. Well, I want you to accept the challenge to grow in this way. There are some wrong reasons to give. And some have been presented as right reasons, but I'm just going to say I think they're wrong. One is the concept, well, you give to get. That's not biblical, to give to get. That's a selfish, self-motivated thing. And unfortunately, I, I think there's been some uh, ministries uh, that have promoted that and, and media ministries that said, you give this much and I'll guarantee you that you'll get a check for a thousand bucks at the bank th you know, in this week. That's not scriptural. In scripture... It, we don't give to get. We give because we're blessed. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference there. Sometimes fear. Fear is the wrong reason to give. You know, if I don't do this, God's going to zap me. Well, I, I don't think so. And fear is not a correct motivation to give. Never... Do you find in, in Scripture that? The other thing is guilt. You know, we all understand what guilt is. And, well, I'm going to give just because I feel guilty. And that will help soothe my conscience, you know. Nah. The verse I read, God loves a cheerful giver. And um, there's some right reasons. I already said it. We don't give to be blessed. We give because we are blessed. Using 2018 statistics, nearly half of the world lives on $2,007.50 a year. That's in 2018. That's last year. Over 50% of the world. I, I uh, don't think I'm going to take time to read it, but, uh, well, I am. I found this. It said, Try these nine steps to live like people in third world countries. And I've been in Haiti, I've been in Africa, and what's described here, it describes it to a T. Here's nine steps to live like people in a third world country. First, take out the furniture, leave a few old blankets, a kitchen table, maybe a wooden chair. You've never had a bed, remember. Second, throw out, throw out your clothes. Uh, each person in the family may keep the oldest suit or dress, a shirt or a blouse, the head of the family has the only pair of shoes. 
Third, all kitchen appliances have vanished. Keep a box of matches, a small bag of flour, some sugar and salt, and a handful of onions, a dish of dried beans. Rescue the moldy potatoes from the garbage can. Those are tonight's supper. Fourth, dismantle the bathroom, shut off the running water, take out the wiring and the lights, and everything that runs by electricity. Fifth, take away the house and move the family into the tool shed or storage shed. Six, no more postman, firemen, government services. The two-room classroom is a school, is three miles away, but only two of your seven children will attend anyway, and they walk. Seventh, throw out your bank books, stock certificates, pension plans, insurance policies. Now you have a cash hoard of five dollars. Eighth, get out and start cultivating your three acres. Try hard to raise three hundred dollars in cash crops because your landlord wants one-third of your money and the lender 10 percent. Ninth, find some way for your children to bring in a little extra money so you have something to eat most days, but it won't be enough to keep bodies healthy, so lop off 25 to 30 years of life. I remember when I was in Haiti on one of the mission trips, we were at the mission down there, and I was talking to a gal that had been in our former church. She worked with the school program there. And they had a feeding program where they would, children would come, moms would come, and, but they would only feed two children out of a family. That's all they could do. And she said the sad thing is the mom has to decide which children are going to get to eat that day and would bring them to the mission. And there again, this is just a couple years ago. So, I, I, there again, I'm, I'm not telling this to make you feel guilty. Or, or, I'm just, man, let's open our eyes. And, and see how God has blessed us. Because there are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that that description fits them to a T today. So we give because we're blessed. We give as an expression of love for what God has done for us. There's an old hymn that was made popular by Mercy Me a couple years ago. It's called The Love of God. And they really made popular this, the third verse of that that hymn, and I, I love the words, I won't sing it because it would ruin it, uh, but if you know the tune, fill the tune in, all right? Could we, with the, w could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. And isn't that beautiful imagery? If the oceans were an inkwell and every man was the scribe and he was dipping in that inkwell to write the love of God and the entire sky was the parchment, we still wouldn't have enough ink or parchment to write it down. We give because of God's love for us and our love for him. And we give because we want to grow in our faith and our trust in God. I love this little illustration. I'm going to read it so I don't get it wrong. So there was a knock on the door of the hut occupied by a missionary in Africa. Answering, the missionary found one of the native boys holding a large fish in his hands. That's why I like this illustration. It has a big fish in it. Right? And the boy said, Reverend, you taught us what tithing is. So here, I have brought my tithe. And as the missionary gratefully took the fish, he questioned the young lad and said, Well, if, if this is your tithe, where are the other nine fish? At this, the boy beamed a big smile and said, Oh, they're still back in the river. I'm going to go catch them now. <laughs> wow. Talk about faith of a child. They're, they're waiting for me. This is God's. And, and he's just got it stored up for me. And it's there. We give because of his love for us. We give because we want to see his kingdom and his church prevail. I love the church. And I honestly believe that the church is the answer for the world today. And when without the church, the world has no hope. Because the church holds the message of Jesus Christ. And we don't have it all figured out here at Anchor. 
I, I will say that we're a church that practices tithing as a congregation, whether you're aware of it or not. 14% of every dollar that you give goes directly to missions. That's above the 10%. We established a policy a couple years ago, any gift, non-designated gift that comes into the church over $5,000, right off the top, first thing we do is we take 10% of that and that goes to missions. And then we take what's left over and we divide it up and, and God blesses that and you're a result of sitting here today seeing that blessing. So God's amazing in his side. And I just want us to, to be a people that take him at his word in all areas of our life. And may God be able to look down at us and, and say the words we find in First John or Third John Verse 4, may these words describe us and hear him say, I could have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. Let's pray.